Before World War II, aviation engineers believed the solution to every problem was more power. Bigger engines, stronger structures, heavier airframes. Yet aircraft performance stopped improving. Speed gains stalled. Range gains disappeared. Fuel consumption increased without clear explanation. Pilots reported instability at high speed, even when nothing appeared mechanically wrong. Eastman Jacobs discovered that the real limitation was not mechanical. It was aerodynamic. The air itself was sabotaging aircraft efficiency. By identifying and controlling hidden airflow behavior, Jacobs removed an invisible barrier that had limited aviation long before the first shots of the war were fired. Before World War II, aircraft performance was reaching a plateau that engineers could not explain. Engines were becoming more powerful, structures stronger, and materials more refined. Yet increases in speed, range, and efficiency were far smaller than expected. Aircraft consumed more fuel without proportional gains. New designs behaved unpredictably at higher speeds. The limits of aviation were being reached not because of mechanical weakness, but because of incomplete understanding. At the center of this problem was air itself. Engineers relied on simplified aerodynamic models that worked reasonably well at low speeds. But these models failed as aircraft approached higher performance regimes. Drag increased unexpectedly. Control surfaces lost effectiveness. Designers compensated by adding power or reinforcing structures, often worsening the problem. The industry lacked precise data on how airflow behaved around real aircraft shapes. Eastman Jacobs emerged as one of the engineers who identified this gap. He was born in 1902 in the United States and trained as an aeronautical engineer at a time when aviation was transitioning from experimentation to applied science. Jacobs did not focus on aircraft design directly. Instead, he concentrated on the fundamental behavior of airflow, believing that performance limitations were rooted in incomplete aerodynamic knowledge rather than flawed mechanical engineering. Jacobs joined the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics, NACA, the organization that would later become NASA. At NACA's Langley Memorial Aeronautical Laboratory, he worked in an environment dedicated to experimental validation rather than theoretical assumption. The laboratory's mission was to produce reliable data that could guide aircraft designers, not to promote specific aircraft or manufacturers. Jacobs quickly recognized that existing wind tunnel testing methods were insufficient. Early wind tunnels produced turbulent airflow that distorted results, especially when studying drag and boundary layer behavior. Measurements varied unpredictably, making it difficult to isolate the true aerodynamic causes of performance loss. Without controlled airflow, engineers could not trust the data guiding their designs. Jacobs focused on improving experimental conditions before drawing conclusions. He played a key role in developing low turbulence wind tunnels, which allowed airflow to remain smooth and consistent during testing. This advancement was critical. It enabled engineers to observe subtle aerodynamic effects that had previously been masked by noise and instability in test environments. Using these improved facilities, Jacobs conducted systematic studies on airfoil shapes. Rather than testing complete aircraft, he isolated wings and sections to understand how air behaved at the surface level. His work revealed that a significant portion of drag did not come from obvious sources like frontal area, but from microscopic airflow. Behavior along the wing surface. Jacobs identified the importance of laminar flow, a smooth airflow regime in which air layers slide over one another with minimal mixing. When laminar flow was maintained, drag dropped dramatically. When it transitioned to turbulent flow, drag increased sharply. This transition often occurred unpredictably, influenced by surface roughness, pressure gradients, and wing shape. Before Jacob's work, most engineers assumed turbulent flow was unavoidable at practical flight speeds. Jacobs demonstrated that with proper airfoil design, laminar flow could be extended over a significant portion of the wing. 
This discovery did not require new engines or materials. It required reshaping the wing to manage pressure distribution and delay flow transition. Jacobs and his colleagues developed a series of laminar flow airfoils that significantly reduced drag compared to conventional designs. These airfoils were not theoretical concepts. They were tested, measured, and validated under controlled conditions. The results showed clear gains in efficiency, range, and speed without increasing power. The implications were immediate. Aircraft could fly farther on the same fuel. They could reach higher speeds without overstressing engines. Performance improvements came from reducing resistance rather than increasing force. This approach aligned directly with wartime needs, even before the war demanded it. As global tensions rose in the late 1930s, military planners sought aircraft that could escort bombers, patrol long distances, and operate efficiently at high speed. Jacobs's work provided the aerodynamic foundation for these requirements. His data influenced the design of wings used on several World War II aircraft. He does all the sale of all the aircraft, including fighters and bombers, where range and efficiency were critical. Importantly, Jacobs did not claim to design aircraft. He provided the data that made better design possible. Manufacturers integrated his airfoil research into their own designs, often without public recognition. The gains were attributed to aircraft models or engine improvements, while the aerodynamic foundations remained largely invisible. By the time World War II began, Jacobs' work had already reshaped aerodynamic understanding. Aircraft entered the war with wings informed by precise airflow data rather than assumption. The result was not a single breakthrough aircraft, but a systemic improvement in performance across multiple designs. Eastman Jacobs demonstrated that aviation's limits were not fixed by physics alone, but by the quality of measurement and understanding. By making airflow visible, measurable, and predictable, he removed an invisible ceiling that had constrained aircraft performance. This contribution occurred before combat validated it, but its effects were felt throughout the war and beyond. This was not innovation through spectacle, it was innovation through clarity. And in modern air warfare, that clarity became decisive long before the first mission was flown. As World War II approached, the aerodynamic work conducted by Eastman Jacobs moved from a laboratory relevance to operational necessity. Aircraft were no longer being designed for isolated performance records. They were being designed for sustained combat missions where range, speed, and fuel efficiency directly determined strategic reach. The data Jacobs had produced at Nakia became increasingly valuable as military requirements intensified. One of the most immediate impacts of Jacobs' research was on aircraft range. Long-range missions required aircraft to travel farther without increasing fuel load. This was especially critical for escort fighters and reconnaissance aircraft. Engine power alone could not solve this problem, as additional fuel increased weight and drag. Reducing aerodynamic resistance was the only viable path. Laminar flow airfoils provided that reduction. Jacobs airfoil designs were incorporated into several wartime aircraft programs. While not every aircraft achieved full laminar flow in operational conditions, even partial preservation of smooth airflow resulted in measurable performance gains. These gains translated into longer escort ranges, higher cruising speeds, and improved fuel economy. The benefits accumulated over entire campaigns rather than single engagements. The P-51 Mustang is often cited in discussions of laminar flow wings, and while its performance depended on multiple factors, the aerodynamic principles Jacobs helped establish were essential to its efficiency. The Mustang's ability to escort bombers deep into enemy territory relied on reducing drag rather than merely increasing engine output. This reflected Jacobs' core insight. Efficiency was a force multiplier. Jacobs' work also influenced bomber design. Heavy bombers operated near the limits of engine endurance and structural stress. Reducing drag improved cruise efficiency and reduced engine strain over long missions. This increased reliability and reduced 
losses unrelated to enemy action. In wartime, these incremental improvements had strategic consequences. Beyond specific aircraft, Jacobs changed how aerodynamic testing was conducted. Prior to his work, wind tunnel data was often treated as approximate guidance. Jacobs demonstrated that controlled experimental environments could produce repeatable, trustworthy results. This shifted engineering culture. Designers began relying more heavily on validated aerodynamic data rather than rule of thumb assumptions. Another important aspect of Jacobs' contribution was boundary layer understanding. He showed that surface quality mattered. Small imperfections could destroy laminar flow and erase performance gains. This insight influenced manufacturing standards, maintenance practices, and even operational procedures. Aircraft surfaces became engineering variables rather than cosmetic details. This created new challenges. Maintaining laminar flow in combat conditions was difficult. Dirt, damage, and field repairs disrupted airflow. Jacobs did not ignore these realities. His work clarified the limits of laminar flow benefits and helped engineers balance ideal performance with operational practicality. This realism prevented aerodynamic theory from becoming detached from battlefield conditions. During the war, Jacobs remained focused on experimentation rather than production. He continued refining airfoil shapes, pressure distributions, and testing techniques. His role was not to solve immediate tactical problems, but to provide reliable data that could be applied across multiple programs. This long-term approach ensured that aerodynamic improvements did not depend on individual aircraft designs. Jacobs' influence extended into training and documentation. His research helped standardize aerodynamic knowledge across the aviation industry. Engineers entering wartime production environments could rely on established data rather than rediscovering fundamental principles under pressure. This reduced development time and improved design consistency. By the middle of World War II, aerodynamic efficiency was no longer treated as optional. It became a baseline requirement. Aircraft that wasted energy through drag were increasingly obsolete. Jacobs' work ensured that aerodynamic decisions were informed by measurement rather than intuition. Importantly, Jacobs did not oversell laminar flow as a universal solution. He treated it as a tool with defined conditions and limits. This disciplined approach preserved credibility and ensured that aerodynamic improvements were integrated responsibly. His work strengthened engineering judgment rather than replacing it. By the end of the war, the principles Jacobs helped establish were embedded in aerodynamic practice. Even aircraft that did not explicitly use laminar flow wings benefited from improved understanding of airflow behavior. The invisible forces shaping aircraft performance were no longer mysterious. Eastman Jacobs' wartime contribution was therefore not a single innovation, but a transformation in how aviation understood drag, efficiency and measurement. His work allowed aircraft designers to extract more capability from existing power rather than chasing diminishing returns. In a war defined by logistics, range and sustained operations, this understanding mattered profoundly. His impact was quiet, technical and systemic, but it reshaped aviation at the moment when precision mattered most. Eastman Jacobs' influence did not end with World War II. In many ways, the post-war expansion of aviation made his work even more relevant. Aircraft entered an era defined by higher speeds, longer ranges, and tighter efficiency margins. The aerodynamic principles Jacobs had established became permanent constraints rather than wartime optimizations. After the war, aircraft designers faced a new reality. Jet propulsion increased speed dramatically, but it also amplified aerodynamic penalties. Drag rose rapidly with velocity, and small inefficiencies translated into large performance losses. The mindset Jacobs introduced, measuring airflow precisely, 
and designing shapes to control it remained essential even as propulsion technology changed. Although laminar flow airfoils were more difficult to maintain at very high speeds, the underlying understanding of boundary layer behaviour carried forward. Jacobs's work had clarified how air interacted with surfaces, how pressure gradients formed and how small geometric changes affected performance. These insights informed swept wings, high-speed airfoils and later transonic and supersonic research. Jacobs also helped establish a research culture that outlasted any single design. Aerodynamics was no longer treated as an art guided by intuition. It became an experimental science grounded in repeatable data. Wind tunnels, pressure measurements and control testing environments became central tools rather than supporting aids. This shift shaped how aircraft were developed throughout the Cold War. The standards Jacobs helped define influenced both military and civilian aviation. Commercial airliners benefited from improved cruise efficiency, reduced fuel consumption and more predictable handling. Military aircraft benefited from greater range, higher endurance and better performance without excessive increases in engine power or structural weight. Jacobs's legacy is especially visible in how engineers evaluate trade-offs. Rather than asking how much power could be added, designers increasingly asked how much drag could be removed. This reframing reduced dependence on brute force solutions and encouraged disciplined optimization. The result was aircraft that achieved more with less. Importantly, Jacobs never promoted aerodynamic theory detached from operational reality. He understood that airflow could not be perfectly controlled outside laboratory conditions. His work defined not only what was possible, but also what was practical. This balance prevented aerodynamic research from becoming disconnected from manufacturing, maintenance and combat use. Over time, Jacobs' contributions became embedded in textbooks, design manuals and engineering education. New generations of aeronautical engineers absorbed his methods without always knowing his name. His influence persisted through processes, standards and assumptions rather than public recognition. Unlike many figures associated with aviation history, Jacobs did not design a famous aircraft or lead a production program. His work operated upstream of those achievements. He shaped the knowledge that made efficient designs possible in the first place. Without that foundation, many later advances would have required far greater cost and risk. In modern aviation, the questions Jacobs addressed remain central. How does airflow behave near surfaces? How can drag be minimized without compromising stability? How can performance gains be achieved without increasing complexity? These are not historical problems. They are ongoing engineering challenges rooted in the same principles Jacobs clarified decades earlier. World War II accelerated aviation development, but it did not invent aerodynamic science. What it did was expose the cost of ignorance. Jacobs ensured that ignorance was replaced with measurement. His work transformed invisible forces into data that engineers could trust. Eastman Jacobs did not win battles or set records. He made aircraft predictable. In a field where unpredictability costs lives and limits capability, that contribution was decisive. His legacy lies in the quiet precision of modern aerodynamics, a discipline shaped not by spectacle, but by control, measurement and understanding.